Well, good morning. I'm Steve Blummer, one of the pastors here at the church. And the last few weeks, a couple weeks, I've been uh, preaching through a small book in the New Testament, the book of Galatians. We're going to wrap that up today. And uh, so if you have a Bible, we're going to turn there. And, uh, but so far in our look in Galatians for the last couple of weeks, we have seen how we need to be crystal clear on what the gospel is. The gospel is the good news of salvation. The news is that you and I are sinners in need of saving. And without that salvation that we are separated from God, we're lost, we're stranded, we're enslaved by this merciless enemy of sin. But God rescued us from our sins as Jesus, God in the flesh, sacrificed himself on the cross, shed his blood for the price, the penalty, to release us from sin's grip. And we've seen that this is not based upon our own actions. It's not based upon our desire to try to do good. We're doing the best we can. It's about grace, a gift that we get that we don't deserve. We've seen how the Apostle Paul, who proclaimed Christ in this region of Galatia, which is modern-day Turkey, to several towns, planted many churches. He saw so many people come to accept this truth of salvation by faith. And so he was adamant that no one should add to the gospel of grace. It would cease to be grace if we did. We're not to somehow alter this gospel of grace with salvation by works or with works. We're not earning more grace more favor from God through rituals or sacraments or wearing of symbols or even markings within our own bodies. And this was a drastic transition from basic like earning salvation through the Old Testament law. And we've seen last week how this gospel of grace is also the gospel of freedom. And that caused some people to feel very uncomfortable as it eliminated what seems to be checks and balances to keep sinners in line. Freedom? And the progression of thought is, won't this make people sin more? And, and, and Paul is saying that you and I are more apt to not sin, to not give in to the flesh when we are immersed in walking with the Spirit. When our focus is on loving God and loving others, when our passion and our purpose has this deep understanding of who God is and what He has done for us, we are compelled to do what he asks us to do. It's liberating because there's no more pressure to perform, no more pressure to conform, no more pressure to be enough, to try to be perfect. It's actually within confinement that comes this frustration, this disobedience, and even rebellion. And so then the next question that flows from that is, well, is there such a thing as sin anymore? And what about when someone does sin within this grace and freedom? Are there no such thing as consequences? Well, of course, there is still sin, and Christians still sin. I still sin. You still sin. Sin doesn't have the same control and power over us as it did before we accepted Christ, but we still have the ability to give into the flesh, to give into that sinful nature. And so, yes, there are consequences. Sometimes those consequences can be quite severe. But those sinful actions they do not divorce us from a relationship in Christ. It's not as though we've fallen now from his grace, tossed back into the ocean, and we somehow have to try to swim back or earn penance from God in order to have a relationship with him again. There might be consequences that have some natural lingering effects, maybe some impact on our human relationships. That damage might take quite some time and effort to mend. But Paul finishes his book, as he often does with most letters, very practical. Let's get down to how to deal with things. So he says, what should we do? What should we do with sin? How should we handle someone who sins in this context of gospel of grace and gospel of freedom? So we're going to read through chapter 6, and then we're going to go phrase by phrase in a section at the beginning. We haven't done that quite yet but we're going to really slow it down to see how Paul says we need to deal with some of these things. So in Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 1, 
If you're using the Bible that's in the chairs underneath you, this is on page 1034. Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourself so that you won't be tempted. Carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone considers himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Let each person examine his own work, and then he can take pride in himself alone and not compare himself with someone else. For each person will have to carry his own load. Let the one who has taught the word share all his good things with the teacher. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap, because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. Look at what large letters I use as I write to you in my own handwriting. For those who want to make a good impression in the flesh are the ones who would compel you to be circumcised, but only to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even the circumcised don't keep the law themselves, and yet they want you to be circumcised in order to boast about your flesh. But as for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through the cross and I to the world. For both circumcision and uncircumcision mean nothing. What matters instead is a new creation. May peace come to all those who follow this standard and mercy even to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble because I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. There's a few things that I'm just going to pull out from this section that I think Paul is encouraging us to process through. And the first one is that spiritual restoration is achieved in a spiritual family. Spiritual restoration is achieved in a spiritual family. Right in the beginning, in chapter 1, verse 2, he says, And all the brothers who were with me to the churches of Galatia. And then in chapter 4, verse 19, he says, My children, I am again suffering labor pains for you until Christ is formed in you. Verse 10 here in chapter 6, Let us work for the good of all, especially to those who belong to the household of faith. But right here in verse 1, it starts out, Brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. The Greek word here is actually literally just brothers. But it's best understood as fellow Christians. Some of the older translations would have just brothers, but Paul is not talking just to the men. Modern translations, that's why they add ancestors. It's like the word man could also mean mankind. Yet the word wants to convey a more personal tone than just fellow Christians. Rather than just saying, hey, there's two people who happen to live in the same town, or there's two people who happen to go to the same church. There are more than that. They're related to one another because they share the same parent, God, as their heavenly father. And so whether you like it or not, you are spiritually related to other true believers around the world. And I think that's important. Paul's describing the spiritual connection, this deep, intimate relationship that other believers in Christ have with one another, so much that Paul calls himself a spiritual father, and these are his children. Now, of course, he didn't go around birthing a bunch of babies on his missionary journeys, but he did see a lot of spiritual baby Christians born in Christ as he proclaimed this message, and they accepted it by faith. So there's a sense of honor as well as a sense of responsibility 
that Paul and others feel towards those that they played a key role in helping them understand these things about Christ, this gospel of grace. And I think that's the way that you and I need to look at each other, that we share a commonality, that we are brothers and sisters in Christ because of God's grace and God's work in us. There might not be a lot of common things between you and your neighbor, but this is significant, and this is enough for us to carry the sense of responsibility and obligation to be there for one another. You know, in general, when a, a child comes to a parent and asks for something, a parent will respond to the best of their ability in an appropriate time to help that child out. If your neighbor needs some help moving a couch, if you have the ability to do so, you'll probably respond. Or if they need a cup of sugar or some maple syrup, or you'll try to respond if it's in the best of your ability. But sometimes when Christians reach out to other Christians, we don't answer and we hope they don't call back. That should not be the case. So I think the first step in this whole restoration process that Paul's going to be talking about, he's making it clear that we need to be there for one another because we are family. And we need to be around spiritual family because we need them. It's often easier to maybe help others than to rather allow other people to help us. But we need help just as much as somebody else does. So let's look at a few more phrases. If someone is overtaken. Overtaken here means to be caught, surprised by, or discovered. And there's a couple of ways of seeing this. It could be that you as a sinner realize that you've slipped into sin and you don't want to be there and you're going to look for help. It could also mean that a person is into sin and it's discovered by someone else. Maybe it's been happening for a while. Um, maybe they knew about it, but now it's brought to light. It's discovered. And in either situation, what is clear is that the person has committed a wrongdoing, some offense. The word if here is not hypothetical. Like, it probably won't happen, but if it happens, this is what you do. It's more of when or in case. Here's how we need to think through these things. Here's what you and I need to do. And he goes through further qualifiers. And I think these qualifiers are important. It helps us to slow down and to really make sure that we're handling things as brothers and sisters in Christ with maximum integrity, maximum sensitivity, and maximum purpose. When someone is caught, surprised by, discovered, in a wrongdoing. What is a wrongdoing? A wrongdoing is a sin, a violation. Crossed the line, broke the law, took a false turn. It doesn't say whether it's severe or not. This is a general word for sin. There's no levels of sins. You know, if I just took a wrong path while taking a hike on Mount Wachusett, that would need some correction maybe not a big deal. Or if I was driving down the wrong way on 190, maybe a bigger deal, right? But either way, need someone to tell me, you took a wrong turn. You're heading in the wrong direction. You know, Adam in Genesis sinned because he ate from the tree that God said not to. Now, many people look at that and says, wow, what's the big deal? You took one bite? But it's not about the amount eaten. It's not about the time and day that it happened. It's not because, well, Eve gave it to him. What's he going to do? It's his wife, you know? Like, he knew what God told him not to do, and he clearly broke his trust. So the scriptures aren't saying that it matters whether it's a big violation or a seemingly small one. In fact, I would say that it's the small ones that most often overtake us or catch us or surprise us every time. 
In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Lay aside every weight and sin that so easily snares you. Some sins are very noticeable. But I think it's the little ones that can go on and on, and they build up over time. And those are the ones that surprise us. And it can be different for different people. The sin that so quickly trips you up may not be the same one that gets me or the neighbor next to you. But we know that Paul also says there's no sin and no temptation that's uncommon to humanity. So you can't think to yourself, I'm so weird. I'm the only one that deals with this. I have no one to talk to. No one will understand. That's not true. In fact, Paul repeatedly conveys the power of the gospel of grace, the power of freedom, the power of God over sin. That it doesn't matter the sin that you're in. That there's power in God to rescue you from that sin. And so clearly all of us have sinned. We kind of just need to get that out of the way. Not that we're not going to take it seriously, but sometimes we give sin more power than it really deserves that we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to seek help. But I think if we've missed any of this so far, we're going to miss how to respond and the objective in our response. So the next phrase is, you who are spiritual. You who are spiritual. This means someone who has received the Holy Spirit, someone who lives according to the Holy Spirit, walks by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's evident in their life because we write about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. If that's you, you get to step forward in a part of this process. If you're not, you might just stay seated. It doesn't mean that we're perfect in all of these ways. But most people have experienced things in life, the struggles that they've been through. But they've also seen how God has worked through them. They've acknowledged that God is the one who got them through what it is that they went through. And so they're giving God the glory and the honor because they really sought him out to find out his wisdom and how to deal with this. And the reason this is important, because the wisdom that we're going to convey to someone who's in wrongdoing is not, this is the lawyer and you got a call. They're going to help you out. Or this doctor, call this doctor, he's the best. Or I know a realtor. Or these are all things that might be necessary. But our focus is on you who are spiritual. And I think this is important because this gives us purpose as we approach someone who is in sin. Or what we want to look for when we are in sin. Someone who is spiritual. Should restore such a person. Should restore such a person. A re restoration means to mend or to completely qualify, to make adequate, to fully furnish, to equip completely. You're really setting them up for success. This gives us the purpose behind our approaching this person and what to do when someone shares with us for assistance. The imagery here is a surgeon who's like setting a bone or a, applying stitches to a wound. It's not a prison warden who applies punishment because they broke the law and they somehow need to make sure they've gone through some processes of punishment before they can ever restore themselves. We know that this is probably not a quick process. To mend a wound, especially a severe wound, there would need to be lots of time of recovery and time to heal. A person's actions during recovery will also help or prolong the process. The process will, might involve learning new skills so that it's not repeated. The process might in, involve routine check-ins for encouragement and assessment and applying next steps. The person who needs restoration will have to be honest and open so that proper care and accountability can take place. The whole point of this process is to restore and amend what was broken. Now, restoration could look different for every situation. 
And restoration will probably not be simply returning to what was before. Things might have completely changed. This might involve a multi-lever plan involving how is your relationship with God? How about any other relationships that were affected? What are things that we need to remove in order to deal with this until you're fully restored? With a gentle spirit. With a gentle spirit. This is opposite of harsh. It's firm, but it's humble. There's no sense of superiority or condescending. Gentle. You and I need to remember that when someone is discovered in sin, if it really did surprise them, there was a time where they have been pushing away the Holy Spirit. They have given in to their fleshly desires. And Paul says they have had this internal battle with the flesh and the spirit. And that internal battle might have left a person pretty bruised up and banged up. And so our approach needs to be gentle. That internal battle might still be going on. And you're going to jump in the middle of that and try to help take control. You might get punched in the face. They've been pushing away the Holy Spirit, and they've probably been pushing away other help for a while. And it's all the more reason that when we get ourselves in a place of sin, that we're finding someone who is spiritual, someone who has the purpose of restoration, someone who does so with a gentle spirit. The next phrase, watching out for yourselves so that you won't be tempted. I'm going to come back to that in the next point. But then carry one another's burdens. In this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. Carry one another's burdens. What does that mean? It means to take up with one's hands. Literally, to pick up and to carry away. To carry one's burdens. The law of Christ that it refers here is simply to love God and to love others. And so, you are modeling Christ in this whole process. It's serving. It's remaining humble. It's having compassion. It's being truthful. It's being gracious. It's being forgiving. And you're coming alongside and picking up whatever needs to be picked up because they've dropped the ball and they don't have the skills necessarily to pick it up yet. And I think this action of picking up a burden and carrying it away is one of the hardest things in this whole process. It reminds me of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Someone was hurt. Other people came by. They didn't have time. They, they didn't you know, want to get involved. Uh, but the Samaritan came along, and they're the one who actually helped, who helped with time, expenses, nurture, enlisting other people to fill in the gaps. And to me, when I think about this practically, that's time-consuming to really be there for someone. And that's a lot. A person, even if they're spiritual, can probably only be there for a few people. And that's why the whole spiritual family is at play. Spiritual restoration is achieved through a spiritual family. You know, a pastor can only mend so many people in one time, one-on-one. -on -one. A small group, a life group, can only minister to a small number of people, personally and intimately. And no one is without their struggles. So it's all the more reason why we're all uh, always talking about starting new groups, looking for leaders to get more people connected as a spiritual family so we can really help carry one another's burdens. What we see in this passage as well is that their self-examination, self-discipline, and self-carry is a requirement. All right, self-examination, self-discipline, and self-carry is a requirement. If anyone considers himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each person should examine his own work, and they don't have a reason to boast in himself alone and not respect to someone else. For each person will have to carry his own load. If someone considers himself to be something is nothing, don't be deceived. And that's why it was in verse 1, it said, Watch out for yourself so you won't be tempted. You and I are all human, 
And there's no temptation that's uncommon to mankind. So the same fleshly battle that someone else is experiencing, you could too, just given the right opportunity. We often gravitate towards people that we can relate to because we've been through what they've been through. And that's a good thing, but it's also a word of caution that we don't want to go back. We need to understand this is very helpful, helpful as we're helping someone to come through on the other side. We've been comforted, we've been restored by God, and we believe God wants us to tell that story to help other people. And that's really how a lot of support groups start. That's how accountability groups start. And it's good, but we need to make sure that we never let our guard down. We make sure that we never forget. Never think that we're past that. We may be setting ourselves up for a spiritual attack. But each person should examine his own work. What does examine mean? Examine means to recognize as genuine after study and assessment, to approve, to deem worthy. So you're looking at your actions, and there's probably a time where you're looking at them and you're said, eh, not good, and you're working on them. Till you get to a point where you say, yeah, that's what I wanted to be. We all need to be students of ourselves. We need to be observant of our spiritual condition. What are our spiritual rhythms and habits in our life? Where do they need adjusting? Where have we been neglecting them? How is that really affecting, say, our mood or our words, our goals, our, our actions, our relationships? What are we doing that's contributing to our increased walk with the Lord? What are we doing that's decreasing our walk with the Lord? What temptations are getting me every time? Where am I? What is happening? What protections am I not putting in place? Do I honestly think this is a problem? Or do I feel like it's fine? I, I can play with temptation. I can stop at any time. I'm far from the boundary. We've got to be honest with ourselves to identify the facts, patterns, to seek explanations, not excuses, but explanations. Why is this happening? And being willing to let God change where God wants to change us. It might be really difficult for us to be truly objective and truly honest with ourselves. But we have a part to play in being restored and being mended and completely being equipped to do what God calls us to do. And then it says, and then he will have a reason for boasting in himself and not respect to someone else. And it's not as though this person, you or me, are taking all the credit. Look what I did. I conquered. Because ultimately we know that it's within God's power, within God's grace, that any of this is possible. So this boasting isn't prideful, like look at me. But it's a high level of confidence and rejoicing as we just remember where we were, what we've been through, and how God has helped us in that process. We remember the moments of real struggle that we had to deal with because no one else was going to be there. So it's being confident and rejoicing in what God has done. And we're focused on not beating ourselves up, but moving forward because of what Paul said at the end there. What matters instead is a new creation. I'm a new creation in Christ. Right? We talked about this last week. I'm a new creation in Christ. God is still working on me. I messed up, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move forward. I'm going to fix what was broken. I'm going to be better. I'm going to seek him and seek his ways. I'm going to include other people into this process. I'm going to find someone who is spiritual, who can help me out. And may peace come to the, all those who follow the standard. And lastly, sowing spiritually will reap spiritually. You have to sow spiritually to reap spiritually. That's what Paul was saying in verses 7 through 10. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. Don't be deceived. Don't be lied to. Just because God is gracious, just because God is forgiving, just because God's nice, doesn't mean that he's going to let it slide. Doesn't mean that he's not going to discipline you as one of his children. Doesn't mean that he's not going to correct you when correction needs to happen. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you will reap. You sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption. You sow to the spirit, you'll reap eternal life. 
I grew up in, in Iowa, as some of you know. Corn, soybeans, big animals, those kind of things, right? And uh, if you plant corn, I've discovered this, when you plant corn, you don't get ice cream cones. <laughs> you get corn. And so if you sow to the flesh, you're not going to weep spiritually. If you sow spiritually, you won't weep the flesh. So be careful about what you're sowing. Be careful what you're planting. Be careful what you're putting in your life. Be careful what you're giving attention to. And then Paul says, we must not get tired of doing good. For we will reap at a proper time if we don't give up. Don't give up. Can you get tired of striving to do good all the time? Honestly, yeah. Can you feel like being good is boring and all the bad people get to have all the fun? Yep. But there comes a harvest time that what you reap, you will sow. If you reap doing the right thing, if you sow doing the right thing, you will reap the right things. It does come easier with practice. Doing the right thing gets easier as you're speaking it out with others and being honest about where you're at. When you're surrounding yourselves with a spiritual family, it gets easier. It gets easier to self-examine, to have self-control, to self-discipline, and to carry your own burdens, and to allow other people to carry your burdens with you. So Paul's saying in this whole book, you've been rescued by God's grace. He hasn't given up on you. So don't give up. Don't go back. Keep moving forward. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your love. God, we are overwhelmed. We know that while we were still sinners, you died for us. And we still sin. We still choose to eat the fruit that we know we're not supposed to. So God, help us not to live in shame and guilt, but to expose it, to bring it to light with a spiritual family. And let us be a good spiritual family that comes alongside others and seeks to restore them, to mend what is broken, knowing that we ourselves are the same and that we all need you to fix what is broken. We need your help in this, Lord. And the band's going to come up, and I, I just want to end this series and just giving you a moment to spend time with the Lord. We've covered three distinct messages in the first week, we talked about the gospel of grace being a rescue mission. God has rescued us from our sins, rescued us from trying to earn salvation on our own. And I know not everyone here has a personal relationship with Jesus yet. And those who might be listening online might have heard the gospel before, but have never stepped out by faith to fully surrender and allow God to rescue. I want to give you that opportunity to do so. And all you have to do wherever you are is to want to admit that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, to believe that Jesus is God's Son who came to rescue you through his death upon the cross and through his resurrection. And then you just confess, call out to him, and he will rescue. You can do that wherever you are. We also learn about the gospel of freedom and this pressure to perform or to somehow earn it or to, you know, look a certain way and talk a certain way rather than just living by the Spirit. And maybe there's those who are here today and they've just been putting on a show, putting on a performance, trying to keep it all together. They just they need to be liberated from that, from the gospel of freedom. 
to truly let it go and, and totally embrace this grace. So maybe that's you today and you just need to, the time with God and give it over and God knows who you are. And there's no shame and no guilt. It's an opportunity for you just to spend God, time with God and confessing those things. And maybe like today, you know that there is some sin in your life and you're, maybe you're not even surprised by it. Maybe you're afraid that it will be discovered. But you don't want to live that way anymore. You, you want to have a thriving relationship with God, with the Spirit. So you've had this internal battle. And you want to seek some, some assistance in the spiritual family. That's, that's who we are here. We're here to show grace, to mercy, to come alongside and help carry that burden. And so maybe that's you. I want to give you that opportunity to truly confess those things, to maybe even uh, grab a brother or sister in Christ and, and maybe find a place, or whether it's up here or wherever it might be, just to pray. So if that's you in, in any of those areas, I invite you as the worship team will just play just for a little bit, an opportunity for you just to pray. You can pray where you are. You can come forward. I can pray with you. Other people would love to pray with you. Let's do that.